Hello there. My name is Dr. Reg Codrington. I have the honor of being the LAPU chaplain and I want to welcome you to our student devotion for this week. I hope you're not going to be um, thinking that I'm rude or discourteous when I say that my topic for this week is how not to be a fool. Hopefully by the time we finish these few moments together you're going to understand from Luke chapter 12 what Jesus was talking about when he told the story of somebody who he called a fool. Now today we use the term fool for, according to the dictionary, a person who is gullible or easy to take advantage of, a person who lacks good judgment, a professional clown, someone who indulges in horseplay. But it's interesting that Jesus didn't have any of those kind of people in mind when he spoke about being a fool. In fact, the whole of the Bible doesn't have those kind of people in mind. In the Bible, God's point of view is somebody is foolish if they are aware of spiritual truth but choose very deliberately to ignore or even directly disobey it. So you can't be a fool by accident. It has to do with very deliberately choosing to ignore or even directly disobey the spiritual truth which God has put in the Bible. And there are several places we can go to. Uh, Proverbs chapter 1 speaks of the fear of the Lord being the beginning of knowledge, but fools, those who are morally deficient, not intellectually deficient, they despise wisdom and discipline. So Jesus is talking about what we are on the inside, what our moral framework is, what our worldview is, not whether we can pass or fail academic tests. And he tells the story about a man who was rich. He had fields, they bore very good crops, and he decided he was going to pull down all his barns, build much bigger barns, and then sit back and say, eat, drink, and be merry, uh, you've got everything that you need. And we'll come back to uh, the implications of that in just a moment. But Jesus warned about this man. He said, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, because a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Now, that's not a popular perspective. It's a very unpopular perspective in our day, because uh, people tend to be judged by what they have, because what they have then results in the clothes they wear, the vehicles they drive, the places they go, the holidays they enjoy. And uh, we need to just understand that Jesus has a very different idea about riches, a very different idea, perhaps, about foolishness. Because stuff can get too important. My wife and I moved a little while back, and when we were just about ready to leave the old place, we came across five boxes in the garage that still had the tape around them from our previous move. And I was all for opening them and examining them, and my wife said, no, she's a tosser, I'm a hoarder. Uh, she said, no, we're just going to toss them. If we haven't needed them in all the years we've been in this house, we don't need them. And she took them straight to the garbage dump and got rid of them. And to this day, I have no idea what was in them. Uh, it didn't make her very popular with me, I need to say. But we need to be sure that we understand that we do not define ourselves or anybody else by what we have or don't have. So the reason why we mustn't do that is because Jesus warned that stuff becomes an insatiable desire. The word insatiable simply means I can't get enough of it. Jesus says we're, we're in a society, they were then, we still are now, even more so today, that we always desire more and more and more. And so he told a parable. And the parable was about this. It is true that a certain minimum of material goods is necessary, necessary for life, but it's not true that greater abundance of goods means greater abundance of life. Chapter then of Manson made that statement, but it's summing up what Jesus was saying. Goods don't make us. Things don't make us. Stuff is not what makes us who we are. And so Jesus talked about a fool. And this was a fool, as I said to you, who wanted to tear down his bonds, build greater ones, 
and then say, I'm just fine. And Jesus said, you are a fool. This very night, your life is going to be required of you. Your soul is going to be required of you. Because here was somebody who was aware of spiritual truth, but chose very deliberately to ignore, even directly disobey. Now, I'm quite sure some of you, uh, as you're watching this, listening to this, are saying, but now hang on, what's wrong with that? If he's uh, been blessed with lots of stuff growing in his fields, why shouldn't he pull down his barns and build bigger ones? Well, let me read the verse to you. Two verses of Luke 12, 18 and 19. This is the man talking now in Jesus' parable. This is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods and I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. Do you get it? Here was a man who was totally self-centered. The problem was not that he had an abundance of goods. There's no sin about having lots of stuff, per se. But he saw all of that for himself alone. He had this huge harvest, and he said, that's fantastic. I can just eat, drink, and be merry. And we live in a day when there are lots of people around us, and sadly even some of them with the name Christian tagged onto them, who think that this is what's important. That we have lots of money, and lots of things, and lots of vehicles, and have exotic holidays, and so on. But the problem is, and Jesus was putting his finger right on it, he says, the problem is there's an unbelievable selfishness here. We are foolish when we think that everything needs to revolve around us. Pastor Rick Warren of the Saddleback Church puts in his book, The Purpose Driven Life, it's not about you. Well, a lot of people seem to think it is about me. And what comes out of that eventually, very sadly in our day, is this unbelievable selfishness. I must get everything I can. Now please don't misunderstand me. I'm not trying to give all of us a guilt complex because if you're watching this, you're like me. You're one of the privileged ones. You've been able to afford to uh, go to a university, to get a university degree. You've probably been able to afford to have the clothes you need, the vehicle that you drive. Uh, you may not consider yourself wealthy by the standards of many people uh, in the country, but you have enough. What Jesus is addressing here is people for whom it's never enough. They are at the center of their world and it's always got to be about me, about me, about me to get more and more and more and more. And I want you to notice that Jesus doesn't mince his words. He says there's an unavoidable outcome for that. You are a fool. And remember what the fool is. A man who's deliberately saying, I've got all of this and I'm keeping it all for myself. He doesn't understand the spiritual principle that if we're given a lot, it's because God is entrusting us with that and expecting us to share it. We live in at a time in our world where there are a lot of very, very needy people around us. Uh, the pandemic has wreaked havoc with many people's uh, income, with their jobs, with their lifestyle, you know, with their health. Uh, bills have mounted up. We've got needy people all around us. And I believe that one of the things that flows from being a Christian or having a Christian worldview, which is what we have at LAPU as a university, and we are proud of that, is that we do not exist for ourselves. We are not in this world just to make sure that I get more and more stuff for me. We are here because we want to share the good news of Jesus Christ, obviously, but we also want people to understand that they are surrounded by people who care. People who genuinely want the best for others. 
And if we don't, then Jesus says, I'm afraid you're a fool. You see, someone has said, and I think they've got a point, self-entitlement is the curse of our century. Where I think people owe me, it's my right. And we have so much being spoken of of our rights rather than our responsibilities. Instead of realizing how privileged we are, there's always the danger of wanting more and more and more. Jesus in Matthew 25, the New Living Translation, says, I tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Or what is it? Jesus said, if you see somebody's hungry, feed them. If you see somebody's thirsty, give them some water. If you think they need clothes, put something on their back. If you think they're just desperately needy, you have a responsibility as somebody with a Christian worldview to come alongside them and do something about them. Now, I certainly don't want this to be a guilt trip for any of us. But I think it is a wake-up call in a world that is suffering, in a world that is needy, in a world that has so many people who would love to have the rich man say, I'm not going to build a bigger barn. I'm going to build a longer table. And I'm going to invite you around my table. And I'm going to share what God has given me. And I believe that whether we have much or whether we have very little, that's our responsibility. You will hear from my accent that I am not from the United States of America. I actually live in Africa, in the country of South Africa, down the southern tip of our continent. And I'm surrounded every day by people who are begging, people who are weeping, people who are out of work. In my country, 32% of people are unemployed. So I face this challenge every day. And we can't solve all the problems but we can solve one. And my challenge to you this week is simply to take this seriously. Let us not be fools who know what God wants us to do, he wants us to understand the spiritual truth that we are here for the benefit of others. We are here to promote God's kingdom. We're here to be the hands and feet of Jesus. We're here to be doing what he would do if he will walk in the streets of your city and mine. And if we do that, well, look at how Jesus speaks in that same Matthew 25. He says, at the end of the day, you won't be received with the words, you fool, your soul is going to be required of you tonight. You're going to hear these words. Come, you who are blessed by my Father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Oh, that we could be like that. That we could hear Jesus say to us, you did it. Just those few small things you did on my behalf made a difference. Made all the difference in the lives of other people. Let's not be fools. Let's be wise. Let me pray for you. Lord, I ask that you would take these simple words and not allow them to be used as any kind of guilt trip, but just a gentle prompt to all of us, myself included, that we must not live for ourselves. We must understand how easy it is to fall into the trap of self-entitlement and resist that. May we be very clear that even as we may be struggling a little bit at, at this time because of what's going on in our world and the world around us. But there are certainly many who are struggling far more than we are. And we are given a responsibility as we carry the name of Christ to say to them, I'm here for you. For Jesus' sake, I am here. May this be true of all of us. And please would you bless us as we seek to be your hands. 
for the glory of God and the benefit of your kingdom. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.